Um, my name is Paul Angus. I'm from Shape Blue, proud architect of Shape Blue. Uh, and today I'm going to have talk to you about <coughs> CloudStack in production, um, and specifically some of our customers, what they're doing with CloudStack, uh, and a bit about CloudStack infrastructure. So uh, some of the hardware kind of trends we're starting to see, just to give an idea of what, what we see happening out there with, with our clients. So um, I'll start off a quick bit on who I am, hopefully. Cloud architect with Shape Blue. Uh, if anyone's seen me talk, you're going to get bored with these slides soon. Um, I specialize in the actual deployments of CloudStack um, and the design around that and the infrastructure, the supporting infrastructure around CloudStack. And then work with clients afterwards for them to understand how to then get the best, if you like, out of CloudStack using the tools that they're used to using. Um, we can see, uh, so, so if you see me on the mailing lists and all the rest of it, what you kind of will see is the direction I'm coming from is great, but how is a client going to use that? How is the consumer of the cloud stack going to get whatever they need out of, out of this feature? Yeah. Um, and so here's a quick slide on the kind of, um, kind of clients that, I, that I've worked with. So to give you a, a feel of where I'm coming from in terms of the, the scale and size of, of those clients we talk about. And then finally, our kind of shape blue slide about who we are. Um, from a kind of personal side, I guess what you can take from this about me is, is that this is what I do kind of for a living. So this is my bread and butter um, and hopefully a good enough at it that I can earn a living. So on to the real stuff. So the first thing I'll look at is kind of use cases. We kind of talk about the use cases, but what, what are they? So test and dev, we, we kind of throw that out a lot. That's our kind of go-to use case, certainly for private clouds. But uh, we are seeing a lot of movement in terms of what those private clouds are doing now. It's not just test and dev anymore. Um, the highly scalable public-facing uh, kind of cloud, so where the uh, private enterprises enterprises are using CloudStack to then form the back-end systems. So they're not um, that the public would be accessing. So it might be some billing system that you, you use with your mobile phone or something that's actually powered by CloudStack. Um, something like Spotify is bridging the gap. It's not just internal. You guys are all using it. You're seeing, getting streaming stuff from it. But it's still, if you like, a private enterprise cloud rather than a, what we call a public cloud. Um, High-speed server resource deployment. I mean, you've, we, we've seen CloudStack. Anyone who's pressed the button or uh, used the API, you know, it just spins up instances uh, as quickly as, you, as, as your hardware enables you to. Um, the reduced reliance on corporate infrastructure teams. I won't name names, but I, can, I could name at least half a dozen off the top of my head. Um, corporation or... Well, people we've gone to who are interested in CloudStack, and one of their main aims, although they'll never write it down, is they want to cut out the networking team. That's pretty much almost an un, one of their unstated goals is to cut out the networking team because they want to produce things, and, and even the, um, sometimes the, the VM teams. Um, I won't say which one because I'll talk about them later. They said that um, traditionally it used to take... Uh, 15 days to get a, a server, if they wanted a server. Then virtualization came in, and somehow it went up to 17 days. Because, because it was all virtualization and a bit wherever, there was a load more forms to sign and a load more stuff they had to go through. Because virtualization meant you could do anything and connect anything to anything, whereas at least when there were bits of tin, they knew what the, the, the kind of networking teams and the hardware teams knew what they'd plugged in, so you couldn't do anything else. When virtualization came along, then and suddenly uh, those teams saw it as being the Wild West. Um, so, obviously, then when cloud, if you then embrace CloudStack, you can then create all these in a matter of seconds rather than quite literally days. And the other one I did mention there is even just firewall changes, changing firewall rules. Um, can quite easily have a week-long lead time because it's got to be done in a certain time um, slot and it's got to have gone through all the, all the QA processes before it's done, regardless of how you know, innocuous that might really be. 
So, um, in terms of real, uh, the real world deployments, we'll go through some of the companies we work with. Buscap, Buscape, it seems to be whoever I ask, it's pronounced differently. Um, very big uh, Brazilian telecoms company. Um, you can see they, they get 60 million visits a month and a presence in 28 uh, countries. So they're, and they run that on CloudStack. Um, they're the kind of e-procurement type services. They're sort of a big central place to go to for all these kind of things. Um, this actually comes back to a lot of what um, has been a hot topic through the, uh, through the conference of people not shouting about what they do. Because the, these guys are massive, but, it's, but we don't necessarily shout about it so much, or certainly not as much as we should. I know we obviously put our press releases out saying it's happening, but we need to get a wider audience to them. So this is still going to be internal because they use AWS, but they still wanted to use uh, AWS to f uh, fulfill uh, some, 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 internal, uh, <coughs> some, some internal use cases. So they wanted to largely migrate all their internal infrastructure to an AWS-like private cloud. They wanted to use all the things they could do in AWS, but they said, right, we want to do this um, internally as well. Um, and you see uh, their kind of stated goal was they wanted to do the test and development, but also they wanted to put their own corporate services on there. So all their uh, Exchange, um, SharePoint, all their internal services they wanted on CloudStack, but also run it for their test dev as well. Um, so they used two kind of networking models to do this. They used the shared networking model within the advanced networks uh, for their corporate type um, functions. So they created multiple uh, networks, um, but they were all shared ones. So they were sort of they didn't want to have lots of virtual routers and lots of natted networks. They just wanted it pretty flat. But then in their test dev, they wanted to be able to create multiple NATI networks which were isolated so that one dev test wasn't going to blow up their entire infrastructure. So here, they're actually looking for the best of both worlds, if you like, the autom automation that comes from CloudStack, but also the separation that comes from uh, the advanced networking. So we talk about um, traded media. They started, they, they were going to shout a lot more about it, but they, they, they've not recently. Um, but you can see in terms of their site, which runs on CloudStack, 20 million unique users per month and 833 million page views per month. You know, that's some pretty hefty stuff they're running on that uh, in the UK. And they're moving, this was from about last year, they were moving that over into their uh, production. So one of the interesting things they do it is they do a lot of um, what you'd call cloud bursting. Uh, they use right scale. Um, and what they do is they said, well, actually to run on AWS all the time means there's a base load which is actually very expensive. AWS gives you lots of flexibility, but if you compare it to actually just having your own tin, it is relatively expensive. So what they wanted to do was bring all of their base load in-house, have all of the uh, automation and everything else staying all pretty much exactly the same as it was when they were just using AWS. But then when they hit certain uh, peaks, that would go into AWS because it was cheaper than having their own tin just lying around doing nothing most of the day. But um, then in the evenings, it would burst to Amazon. And you can see from this, we're talking about doing this on a daily basis. This isn't a kind of end of the month, oh, it's a billing cycle, we're gonna, uh, we, need, we need a bit more compute. This is all day, every day, going up and down, up and down on a, on a cycle. So um, it's, we have to be very reactive, if you like. The other interesting thing um, they looked at was, if you like, we've got here, uh, your, hello, we've gone off the end of the screen. Can we make the, um... oh no, no it's me, sorry, I'm just looking at it from an angle, pick your problem. Um, 
your standard deployment would look something like this, and then you connect to a, a, separate, uh, a separate data center. And you've got a link that's running across to all of those hosts. Um, and they weren't happy with, with having that kind of setup. So, hello? What am I in there? Where's all the. So I just jumped right to the end. Um, so they moved to using Galera. So Galera sits under MySQL, um, is a clustering technology. Uh, the way that works is you need a very high speed or low latency links between your two sites. But what it enables you to do is have effectively all six of those MySQLs as masters. Um, you need the very low latency because a write isn't committed or isn't seen as committed until it's been written to all of the MySQL cluster. Um, but by doing this, it meant if they had a loss of connection between their data centers, the other one could just carry on. Um, and then they would have to obviously be careful when they brought the link back. But you see, you can, um, it's a very kind of, we haven't seen a lot of people using Galera. I think I can think of one other company. But it's the fact that people are finding interesting and new ways of connecting these things together. Well, that's another use case you can look at. And also, I mentioned earlier, they use right scale for their balancing, if you like. So they use the right scale templates, which are in Amazon, and um, they're using CloudStack. So that if they say, I want web server type A, it knows which type of template that is in Amazon and which type of template that is in um, CloudStack. And so it can just keep them all in line. So if you say, I want a web server A in uh, Amazon, it knows which one to spin up. And it will be exactly the same as the one in um, CloudStack, but obviously the, the build of it is slightly different for the two different um, clouds. So uh, another one of our customers, Paddy Power. I don't know if you saw them in Amsterdam. And a very uh, interesting talk on killing dinosaurs. Um, Paddy Power are a bit different in their approach to things. Um, but to give you an idea of what, their, uh, what kind of usage they look at, we've got a couple of years ago, 1.6 million users and generating half a billion dollars from their online sales a year. So um, again, this is like the high-end stuff that they're then uh, using CloudStack, or going to use CloudStack, uh, to help get to. So this uh, CloudStack wouldn't go into their actual production as yet. This would be in their, all the pre-production work. And a lot of it was all about getting from pre-production to production faster and more efficiently. Um, so one of the things they were doing for their um, guys was basically creating um, environment templates um, so that a developer could have an idea. Uh, and they were really big on, if you've got an idea, just go and have a go at it. Um, and then if it works, great. If it doesn't, it's not, no big deal. But by creating their environment templates, what it enabled them to do is very quickly just create an environment. A developer could try out their idea. And if it didn't work, blow it away. And if it did, then they could go shout about it, tell everyone else, and they could then start developing it. Um, and they're, they're very proud and big on that kind of way of developing. Let developers just have their ideas, give them somewhere they can try them out quickly and easily, and then um, with no kind of repercussions and no big financial cost. If it had taken uh, weeks to get the whole environment set up for them to spend half a day to say, oh, actually, it didn't work, obviously that would be uh, more problematic. They're also a big uh, fan of the Netflix kind of Chaos Monkey and Simeon Army. Um, so if you don't know what that's about, uh, there's a whole set of tools. But the idea is that largely you're trying to deliberately disrupt your architecture. You're trying to uh, deliberately break sections of your architecture to prove that it will still work. So where we talk about cloud design, and the idea is you're designing for failure, you're designing that if you lose this host or that data center, 
or that application server, the bigger application will work its way around that problem itself. It's designed to do that. Um, where the Simeon army comes in, and as I call, coined it, problems as a service, it's literally trying to kill bits of that um, infrastructure to overload it, to overload hosts, to cause network storms, and make sure that the rest of the environment, in fact, the, the product they're trying to give to the end user, remains unchanged. So the end user would not know that a whole chunk of their infrastructure had suddenly stopped working. And by running that all the time, they can prove to themselves that actually that, that is the case. And I said about uh, the faster transition from development actually to production. So one of the, the kind of things that always happens is the developers will come up with uh, something and they will get thrown over to production and suddenly they'll find that actually there was a load of firewall rules or and ports that needed opening and things that needed setting up that they hadn't realized were actually required in their design. They just obviously opened up every port um, everything was allowed to talk to everything, and it all worked great. As soon as it went to production, and production rules started coming in, and they said, well, give us a list of the ports, and they said, oh, it's uh, that one, that one, that one, and then it didn't work. And they said, oh, I didn't know there were any others, and then they have to go back and find out what they've missed. By uh, doing something like this, where you'd use, for instance, a virtual um, appliance, which would be the same as the physical one, more or less, where certainly the, uh, your, your configuration files would be, what they could do is design their application, lock it down, make sure it still worked, and take literally the configuration file and give it to production and say, there you go, this is the configuration that will make it work. Um, the production guys can obviously look at that and go, well, you're not doing that, or um, say, great. And if they want, just copy and paste it in and say, go. So it, the idea was to basically be able to make that transition from a development platform to the production platform, um, much, much uh, slicker and a lot less of the uh, basically faffing around trying to figure out how everything was supposed to work. Um, the name of this company was mentioned, I think, in the keynote of ApacheCon. Um, so who they are is in the public domain, but I'm not allowed to mention their name uh, directly here as a client. Um, but to give you an idea of what they do, um, if you probably can work out who they are. Again, we're talking about a huge number of people um, accessing their services, and certainly I'll be, I'll be complaining if it goes down as much as anyone else. Um, now, the first thing uh, they like, didn't like was the idea that uh, they needed an end tier like kind of structure but they didn't like having a, a single, or even a, in a pair, virtual router. Uh, we came to the age old, well, what's the performance characteristics of a virtual router? And it just depends. Depends what you're trying to put through it, depends on the hardware, because it's a virtual router. Depends how much memory you gave it, depends how many cores you gave it, and it, say, depends on the quality of the process that's underneath it. Um, so because no one could actually really say, um, we went to using um, security groups. So we were running beta versions, if you like, the pre-release versions of 4.2 because we needed the security groups in the advanced zones. So you can see here, um, they were using the security groups to create effectively their tiers. So you still had that tiering kind of idea with only certain ports allowed through between them. Um, whilst not having any bottlenecks because it was all direct communications when it was allowed. So it, that kind of distributed security um, worked really well for them. They also use Amazon. Um, they use Akamai, to decide, uh, which will then steer the traffic between the two different um, uh, locations, either their data centers or AWS. Um, the majority of the traffic would go to their data center, was, the, was where the uh, plan is. Um, and obviously that means you've got to create a VPN or have the, the direct link. So they obviously ran both for, the, for uh, resilience. 
Um, but to maintain their uh, database consistency across the two, they had a direct link in from their data centers to Amazon, but also uh, VPNs for backup. Um, I can tell you from their experience, setting up the VPNs is not a simple job um, if you need multiple points going backwards and forwards. Um, but again, you say, what I'm trying to get across is the uh, different ideas that people are coming up with and the different things you can do and use CloudStack for. Um, so in terms of actual infrastructures, still the, the vast majority of the time, this is the kind of um, topology, if you like, for the management side that we see. A couple of load balancers in an HA pair, a couple of uh, management servers behind that, and then MySQL still in master-slave. Um, we talked about Galera, there's MySQL clustering. Um, I've seen people playing with using a DRDB to get the replication of the MySQL at a file level rather than a database level. Um, as yet, I don't think there's any sort of bullet that just makes everything just work and is um, all warm and fluffy and fuzzy. But basically, the vast majority of um, builds we see would work like this. And a lot of these then would run um, multiple zones all from the central location. One of our clients has um, cloud stack zones in India, China, and then Europe. And it's all run from just the European um, cloud stack management servers. Just a pair of them behind their load balancers. So in terms of the typical hardware that we're actually seeing at the moment, this doesn't write, read across, it obviously reads down. Um, I, the vast majority have been NetApp, but we have had some that use a little bit of Nick Center. Hitachi happened to be the fiber channel over Ethernet. Um, uh, and obviously a few solid fire as well is becoming popular uh, in some places. Protocols are overwhelmingly still NFS. Um, and so we had the one customer who already had their fiber channel over Ethernet to their Hitachi stuff. So uh, that's what they wanted us to carry on using because that's what they used in their infrastructure generally. Um, and a very little bit of iSCSI, but not a lot. Um, networking, still one, mostly one gig and throwing a load of um, interfaces at it to, to bomb them and get throughput. Um, a few people are starting to use the 10, mostly for storage, and uh, 40 gig on if they're using blades and stuff. Um, there is a, where we used to separate out all of our traffic over individual links, there's now, we're seeing a lot of people looking at that and going, well, if I just put some a redundant, redundant 10 gig links in and then pipe all the traffic in VLANs through that, that gives me pretty much a load of uh, bandwidth that I couldn't get with just having one gig NICs and basically we'll just we will assume we won't have a, a contention problem between different network traffic types. Um, in terms of the storage, now we're definitely seeing a move at the moment away from the more traditional cloudy idea that we kind of all started with where you'd have, if you could, one array per cluster. And if that failed, then just that cluster failed, nothing else failed. Then we went, that's a bit, it's so inefficient, it's, it's almost unusable. So one array, array per pod, and that seemed kind of acceptable. But we're, um, we've seen a move to people just having huge kind of um, arrays, which then run the entire zone. Um, and although it kind of is outside of our kind of cloudy ideas, we see more and more customers, that's what they've got and that's what they want. Um, so you, at the end of the day, they're the customer. So we are seeing a definite move from the storage looking a lot less cloudy than um, we possibly would like. Um, in terms of compute, overwhelmingly HP at the moment. Um, seeing more Cisco, that's definitely coming in more with the clients we're working with. Um, a bit of Dell and then the sort of super micro stuff, uh, a tiny bit, but not so much. Um, there we've just picked out uh, the kind of number of cores we're seeing per server. 
there is again a, a, this move to having just bla actually using blade chassis and having that as a cluster, for instance. Um, there's a different move to where we would have originally said, oh, you just want uh, lots of little pizza boxes, and then your um, failure domain is as small as possible. So if you lose one of these boxes, it's not the end of the world because you've got a hundred others. So you've lost a hundredth of your um, of your infrastructure. But certainly is, uh, there's this move to actually using bigger and bigger single boxes because the counter argument that the clients tend to come up with is, yeah, but if I've got 100 boxes, that's 100 hypervisors I've got to look after. Um, I'd rather have 10. I'd rather have big, massive boxes and not have to look after so many hypervisors. Um, again, not so cloudy, but that's definitely a, a trend we're seeing a lot of and having to, where we can, argue against. Um, the good old hypervisor argument. Uh, mostly, I think we're seeing Zen Server going in, and then probably KVM, and then ESXi, and the ESXi guys are usually uh, enterprises, and that's what they've got, that's what they've always used, and you're, you're never going to pry them away from it. Um, and particularly service providers, they don't, they've spoken to their customers and their customers won't be happy if they move them away to something else other than uh, VMware. Um, so that is usually what happens with there. But otherwise, KVM, Zen Server are the ones we're seeing getting deployed from a sort of greenfield kind of idea first. Um, and finally here on the networking, Cis yeah, it's like Cisco, 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 pretty much in terms of what you'll see as network hardware. A uh, little bit more ju Juniper coming in at the moment. Um, I've, seen, I've seen one company using Arista, but uh, it's pretty much the vast majority Cisco. And you say that obviously the networking speeds uh, we've already kind of covered on, but that's what we'd see going through. As a 10 gig is, has been traditionally only used for storage, but we're seeing more people trying to basically just have two 10 gigs and put everything through that. Uh, usually we're stacking in some kind of way, but um, the KVN guys and Zen server, if you're using advanced networks, obviously now you can LACP. So that's where you might still stick with one gig and have four to six, say, um, interfaces to get that through. Um, the biggest number of one gig um, ports I've seen in a client server is 12. Um, so they were using LACP and then separating these out to have six for guest traffic, four for um, storage traffic, and then two for the management. And then each of those were using LACP as, to give you four gig, six gig, and, and two. Uh, so is there any uh, questions? Hello, yes. Yeah, can you comment on... Uh the use of virtual routers versus the hardware that you just went over in terms of production? I mean, are people using the virtual routers or is it typically? Uh, so the question is, are people really using virtual routers or are they just doing it through yeah. hardware? Yes, people are using virtual routers, um, but they are a bit nervous about it. Um, it's not popular. And certainly, I think some of the SDN solutions that do away with it that might be the thing that really pushes people towards SDN, even more than the extra flexibility over VLANs, is the fact that you can have this kind of distributed um, routing. On the uh, VPC side, or is it just the, the notion of a virtual router? I think the notion of a little Linux VM yeah. is just gives people the shivers. Um, even though it's probably the same thing in the Cisco hardware. Yeah, I mean, and, and um, you could replace it as people looking at replacing virtual routers and being able to use uh, virtual appliances. So a Cisco virtual router and putting that in instead. Um, I think we've got some clients that are talking to us. That can we if, we, if they give us like their virtual router that they actually use, be it a Viata or a Cisco, and can we then orchestrate that? or get the code in so that can be orchestrated, that can be the virtual router. Um, there's a kind of says, well, what's the difference? But Thank you. So the motivation for that would be automation 
a cost or both? For? For moving to virtual uh, appliances versus a physical router, for example? Well, the, the motivation uh, for moving to using these virtual ones is because it's in, then part of the cloud stack build. So you're, or you, you're going to create um, 30, 40, 50, 100, 2,000 networks. And if each one needs a, its own router, then you're really going to want virtual routers doing that. Um, it depends on the use case. Obviously, in a more, more public clouds are far more likely to have lots and lots and lots of networks. Enterprises may or may not. It depends on um, their use case. So we've just got one minute left. You mentioned Paddy Power creating those software templates, so we, we know them as we help them orchestrate uh, that automation. Can you tell us about other customers? Are they using any kind of automation frameworks? What, what, what do you see in the field? Yeah, um, we, I'm trying to remember which customer names I can name. Um, we've seen, um, we have a client that uses Cloud Foundry, so they, um, are now actually preferring to move to using Ansible as a configuration management and automation tool. And they're preferring to actually move to actually using that to create their PaaS, if you like. Um, so Cloud Foundry is the main other one uh, that we kind of see or hear of as a platform that's already pre-made. I'm trying to think of other ones. Are you thinking purely of creating the template type in, in, templated environments, if you like. Um, or more than that, automating uh, the provisioning and uh, installation and gluing of everything together uh, to create a whole application as as Paddy do, as Paddy Power do. Uh, I've seen something like that in, in another uh, with another with other customers of yours. I think you think a, n a high, large number of them are doing it. That way. So the question is, is, are people automating the creation of these environments? And the, the, the easy answer is yes. Um, they're usually doing it with their own kind of tooling, I think, more than using a, a, a prepackaged thing to do that with, like your Cloud Ops stuff and, uh, or Cloud Foundry. Um, oh, I think we're, no, we're out of time because someone else wants to come and talk. So um, there's some. Resources obviously are, will be up on our slide share, so you can uh, read up on any of this or just come and find us in the booth upstairs. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>